the second will be a swab of the vent surface. EV1 will then translate to the laboratory's carbon dioxide vent to sample that location. Next, EV1 will return to the airlock to swab samples at various locations around the airlock hatch. While EV1 performs the microorganism sampling, EV2 will go to the zenith or top side of the external stowage platform. EV2 will remove the multi-layer insulation covering a spare robotic arm joint. EV2 will release three of six fasteners using the pistol grip tool. Then, EV2 will drive the joint's motor approximately 6 degrees. This prepares the joint if it's needed on a subsequent contingency EVA. After recovering the joint, EV2 takes the crew lock bag back to the airlock, where EV2 will replace some tethers in the bag. So to talk a little bit more about the details of the RFG Retrieval 2.5 EVA, as the name implies, the top priority is to remove the RFG and return it to the ground for refurbishment. The RFG is the radio frequency group, which is an S-band antenna, and was previously unable to be relieved from the stanchion mounting plate during US EVA 86. This time, we will be using a unique wrench tool to release the compressive force on the wedge clamps, which will release the hardware and allow it to be removed. Once removed, the RFG will be put into the airlock and then come back to Earth for refurbishment on the ground. The second task is to collect microorganism samples. Uh, the goal of this task is to swab external locations on the ISS in order to determine the presence of microbial life surviving a vacuum. Uh, specifically, we're checking locations where microbes from inside the ISS could have been deposited on external services, like near vents and the airlock, and then we're looking to see if that life could have survived in the vacuum of space. Finally, this EVA will prepare the spare robotic arm elbow joint uh, for a future potential r, &R if it's needed uh, by removing some of the launch fasteners and setting the joint angle. Overall, uh, the road to or our preparations for all of these EVAs has been going well. Uh, the crew on board has been studying their procedures and getting familiar with all of the tasks and are really excited and looking forward to going out the door, as well as the teams on the ground have been doing their last preparations, making sure that everything's ready to go. And we are also very excited for the spacewalks coming up over the next couple of weeks. With that, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you very much, Bill, and thank you very much, Nicole, for joining us and talking us through all the details of the upcoming EVAs that are coming up here in the next uh, couple of weeks, scheduled for, again, Thursday, January 16th and Thursday, January 23rd, and you can follow along on NASA+. Plus. We'll transition on to our question and answer session, and then for those media members that are watching online or watching through NASA+, Plus, if you wish to join the conversation, please press star 1 to join the phone bridge. If you find that your question has already been answered or wish to retract that question, please use star 2. And we'll start with the phone bridge and Gina Sunferi with ABC News. Uh, thank you. Um, we know they're both two experienced spacewalkers, but were they able to do any training while uh, on the space station, virtual reality, or how do you train for a spacewalk when you're in space, but you weren't be able necessarily to train for it in the NBL, or is the NBL training enough that they can do this without that specific training? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and so something we've been talking about a lot, a lot of what you mentioned, the NBL training or the neutral buoyancy lab is where the astronauts learn how to do the basics of spacewalk and do a lot of task training. So they get familiar with lots of different types of tasks, such that if something comes up on board that they need to do um, that they haven't necessarily seen before, um, they have that familiarity with the general task types. Um, that being said, they have been doing a fair amount of training on board as well um, to get familiar with these sequence of events. Uh, we give them all of the procedures well ahead of time, so they'll have studied the actual procedures. Um, and then they do also have um, 
a essential model of the ISS and they can walk through all of the different steps um, that will be going on while watching a video similar to the one that we just saw, but in a lot slower detail and goes step by step through each of the different handrails, the different translation paths, um, as well as then each of the different tasks that they'll be doing. Uh, one of the last things that they really do to get familiar with the hardware, so we talked through some of the hardware here, um, and similarly that new wrench as well as the location and how big the RFG is. Um, so they'll actually prepare by touching and manipulating the hardware that they'll be taking outside with them. So for example, they've seen the nicer patches ahead of time and are able to practice using those while inside so that they know how they'll behave uh, while they're outside as well. Thank you very much for the question. And for those following on social media and NASA Plus, we invited you to join our conversation as well using the hashtag AskNASA. And this question comes from Instagram. Aaron wants to know, how do all these materials and tools that the astronauts use get up to the crew? You know, uh, it's a great question. As with everything that we fly up, we have to plan ahead. And we fly these materials and tools and everything that we need on the various cargo missions that come to and from the space station. So these tools, some of these tools have been on board for, for quite a while. Some of them arrived more recently on various cargo missions that we've had. So we fly them up from the ground, and uh, that's how they, they get to station and get ready to go out. So we have a lot of forward planning to get them on board when we need them. Thank you very much for your question on social media. And back to the phone bridge for Ryan Catton with nasaspaceflight.com. Hi, thanks very much. Uh, I'm curious with the suit specifically, because we've seen over the last few years, they appear to be becoming a little bit unreliable. So I'm just wondering how eager NASA is for uh, 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 an updated fleet of suits, uh, shall I say? Is that something that you're interested in? Is that something that you would like to see? Thanks. Well, clearly we have to maintain the suits. They've, uh, we've had them in our, in our fleet for a, for a long time. They do get periodic maintenance on the ground, and we fly them down, take care of them, fly them back up. They get maintenance on board. And so we're confident in the suits that we have on board, obviously, to continue to perform. Um, there has also been uh, work being done on new exploration suits, and there are some applicability of it with that to ISS uh, down the road if, those, if and when those suits become available to us. Thank you very much for your question. I'll turn it to Robert Perlman with Collect Space. Thank you. Um, sort of working off that last question, the last two uh, U.S. spacewalks were stymied by uh, by spacesuit issues. Have you added any additional steps in the preparation for these EVAs to double check on suit fit or on um, on cables, or are there any additional steps or precautions you're taking? to sort of avoid running into that same thing. And then if I may, a uh, specific question about EVA-92. What is it about the elbow joint on the, uh, on the Catarm-2 that is causing concern that it might need a replacement? Okay, um, so just answer your first question first. Um, the suits overall, um, and as a result of uh, the EVAs we attempted last June. Uh, we actually just completed some suit fit checks yesterday uh, for the crew. Um, so they got into the suit, got fully suited up um, and taken to pressure, and then were able to practice using some of the hardware uh, and make sure that they would be ready to go out the door. So we've confirmed that their suit fit is uh, very good and that they'll be ready for next week. Um, and then as we're continuing to work with these suits, um, as Bill mentioned, right, there's a lot of data that we're watching on the suits in real time, both on the ground and the, what the crew can see on their heads up display. Um, so they are also um, able to have all of that information live and make sure that everything looks good. Um, going to your second question about the elbow joint, um, nothing specifically that we're tracking that's a problem with it. We're really just, if we ever needed to go out and replace it, um, this would be a joint that we'd want to replace very quickly because we use the robotic arm so often. Um, and so we're getting it prepared such that it would be in a better configuration if we ever needed that EVA uh, to go and do the full replacement of the joint. So this just gets it in a, uh, the position of the joint in the angle that we would want in order to complete that r, &R. Thank you very much for that question. Going back to our phone bridge, Mark Carroll with Aviation Week Space Technology. Yes, thanks. Um, I would like you, if you could, to just kind of review how you address the uh, uh, umbilical coolant leak in the airlock from the uh, last spacewalk attempt. Uh, sure. Uh, we've obviously we 
first step was to replace the hardware itself, right? We had an issue with that particular umbilical, uh, so we changed it out with a new one and we tested it in the suit. Um, the team has also updated procedures uh, for if it were to occur again to improve upon our response uh, from the last time. The crew did an awesome job uh, responding to, to that water um, during that EVA. Uh, we've taken, as we always do, we try to learn from everything that happens on board and we've added a few things. We didn't have to add very much because most of the things that the crew had already been trained to do were absolutely right. We added a towel into the airlock to help with, uh, with water if it does leak. But otherwise, it's, uh, we've basically r and the faulty hardware and, and we've done an investigation and we have a really good idea of what caused it. Thank you very much for your question. And we'll go back to social media using the hashtag AskNASA if you wish to participate in today's conversation. Maddie on Instagram asks, how do you ensure astronaut safety during a spacewalk? Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of what we've been talking right about is how do these suits work and how do we know that they're healthy? Um, and so really what we're doing throughout the preparation for a spacewalk and then throughout the whole thing is making sure that all of the parameters on the suit where we're understanding the pressures and the temperatures of each of the different subsystems um, are within bounds and within bounds of what we expect and what we need them to be uh, to keep the hardware safe. Um, in the unlikely event that we did have a concerning event, uh, we do have quick response procedures some that the crew and the ground teams have memorized uh, and some that they have available to them throughout the course of the EVA um, on their cuff checklist, which they actually wear on their arms, so we could respond to any of those um, concerning data measures. And again, I said before, but they've got the display in front of them, which allows them to have a heads-up display view of various parameters, and then we get a lot more data that we can see on the ground and be able to voice up to them if we're seeing something that's trending in an unexpected manner. Thank you very much for that question and submitting on social media. And our final question is a follow-up from Gina Sunferry with ABC News. But um, the leak issues you've been seeing in the Russian segment, how is the investigation of that proceeding? Uh, the investigation continues. We're working very closely with our partners at Roscosmos uh, to continue to look at the potential causes of the leaks, as well as identifying their locations within that small transfer tunnel. These are very small cracks that show up. They're very hard to see. In fact, you really can't see them with the naked eye. It takes a microscope a lot of times to go find where these things are. And so the teams continue to work very closely together with ground testing and through the operations that our Roscosmos colleagues are doing on orbit. Thank you very much for that question. And that is all the questions that we have for today. A big thank you to Bill Spech and Nicole McElroy for joining us to discuss the upcoming spacewalks that will be occurring outside the International Space Station. And thank you for tuning in on NASA Plus. You can tune in on NASA Plus for all the coverage around these spacewalks again on Thursday, January 16th and Thursday, January 21st or 23rd, pardon me. U.S. Spacewalk 91 is scheduled to begin at approximately 7 a.m. Eastern time and last about six and a half hours. And NASA Plus coverage will begin at around 530 a.m. Eastern time. Thank you for joining us from NASA's Johnson Space Center.